For years, I have always needed to own two computers, a Mac desktop for all my power user needs, but also a portable solution, which was usually a MacBook Pro. And honestly, I need a pretty powerful MacBook Pro to kind of do all the work I need to do. But that might be changing because Apple now has this new 16 inch M3 Max MacBook Pro. And this thing is a powerhouse with a 16 core CPU, a 40 core GPU, and it can be configured with up to eight terabytes of storage and 128 gigabytes of RAM. This thing is like having a Mac Studio in your backpack. It is packing an insane amount of power. But is this finally the all-in-one Mac solution that I have been searching for? Or quite frankly, is this thing kind of overkill for my needs in the modern Apple Silicon computing world? It might just be. But it doesn't matter how big Apple makes the display on these laptops, to get most of my work done, I connect it to an external display. And for the past month, I've been using this new 27 inch BenQ design monitor, which has been amazing. First of all, this monitor just looks so clean on my desk. And unlike other monitors that ship with a short stand with limited adjustability, this monitor has BenQ's ergo arm, which just offers a ridiculous amount of adjustability. You have height adjustment, tilt adjustment, you can swing the monitor closer to you, and you can even completely flip the display 90 degrees to give you a vertical monitor setup. This arm just offers so much flexibility and is so comfortable to work on because you can pretty much adjust it exactly to your needs. If you've never used an ergo arm before, trust me, it is a game changer. Now, as great as this ergo arm is, I also need a color accurate monitor because I spend most of my time video editing and BenQ delivers with an excellent factory calibrated monitor with an impressive P3 color space, complete with HDR10 and a 4K resolution. The display just looks fantastic for every bit of content, text is super sharp on it, picture looks great, and it is a matte design, which means if you work in a bright environment, there's very little glare on it. I even pointed my studio light directly on the display and there was zero reflection. I also love that BenQ has a separate MacBook color profile built right into the monitor and it features active color syncing. So the display always matches up perfectly with my MacBook Pro for a seamless experience between both monitors. I also love this ingenious settings dial that BenQ provides that solves issues I've had with other third-party monitors monitors where changing settings can be a bit finicky. This wheel is super easy and fast to use and I can quickly change the monitor's brightness or change color profiles with these built-in hotkeys. I actually thought with all of these features and the excellent ergo arm that this monitor was going to be a lot of money, but for a designer worthy monitor, it's only $630. So if you need a color accurate monitor with unlimited flexibility for your Mac, make sure you check out BenQ's designer monitor in the description below. And thank you to BenQ for sponsoring this video. So at first glance, this MacBook Pro doesn't look all that special. It is the third iteration of the same design we got back in 2021. And yeah, it's still a great looking design, but like all designs, the more used to it you are, the less special it feels. So for me, uh, this generation of MacBook Pro, you know, it's the same. It feels like the same laptop I've been using for like the last two years now. But for a new user, yeah, you're going to appreciate uh, this new design and all the highlighted design features that come with it. So if you are coming from an older MacBook Pro, you're getting shrunken bezels around the display, a squared off body that houses uh, more ports with a MagSafe charging port, three Thunderbolt USB-C ports, an SD card slot, an HDMI port, and of course a headphone jack. Now, you know, kind of like a new design feature of this MacBook Pro is the new space black color. And after living with this new color option for over a month, I do have to say that it is definitely an improvement over the old space gray color. And in most lighting situations, it does look pretty close to black. And it's a really nice stealth appearance to the overall build. Apple said they put a new coating on this space black MacBook Pro to reduce fingerprints. And yeah, that's kind of true. I compared it against my midnight MacBook Air and it's much more fingerprint resistant, but don't be fooled. It's not fingerprint proof just resistant. So uh, over a month of using it, there's some slight fingerprints on it as I'm looking at it now. The other new thing here is the display does get brighter for SDR content. So it goes up to 600 nits of brightness compared to 500 nits on the older MacBook Pro. Uh, but I can't say that's made like a huge world of difference for me. Maybe I'm just not using my MacBook in bright enough environments where I would notice the increase in screen brightness. But yeah, uh, you know, it's always nice to have a brighter screen, but it really hasn't made that big of a difference for me. Now, the real change here is really centered around the internals of the MacBook Pro. This is Apple's, and I guess the world's first three nanometer chip, 
running in a purchasable computer. And while I've talked at length in other videos about the other M3 variants, this particular 16 inch MacBook Pro is running on the M3 Max chip. And this year, the difference between M3 Max and M3 Pro are bigger than ever. That's because for the first time, Apple is letting the Max version of the chip not only have more GPU cores, but more CPU cores as well. So my model in particular is a maxed out M3 Max with the full 16 core CPU and 40 core GPU. And oh man, is this thing an impressive feat of chip engineering. I know benchmarks get a little boring and hey, I'm guilty of being a boring person, just look at me. But I look at these CPU numbers in Geekbench and Cinebench and yes, I'm fully aware these are synthetic benchmarks, but when I see scores this impressive, you'll get my attention every time. So not only are we seeing a 35% jump in multi-core CPU performance over the M2 Max, but Apple is basically giving us a chip that fits in a smaller laptop body that is scoring on par with their desktop class M2 Ultra chips. But here's the rub. My 14 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro was already crazy powerful and crazy efficient. So is this M3 Max 16 inch model a worthy upgrade to that Mac? Now, yeah, in raw benchmark performance terms, we are seeing an absolutely insane jump compared to the M1 Max. In my two-year-old MacBook Pro, with a 26% performance jump in single-core performance and a massive 54% increase in multi-core CPU performance. Now, in theory, you think this would make a massive difference in every application and in every use case. However, the truth of the matter is that the first generation of Apple Silicon was already such a speed bump compared to Intel Max that even though I am quoting massive performance increases here, you really don't see that level of performance jump in real world usage for most tasks because let's face it, most of us simply are not capable of using the additional raw horsepower that this M3 Max chip provides. So yeah, side by side, if you were to take like uh, an M3 Mac and put it against an M1 or an M2 Mac and start like opening like a bunch of apps, like the M3 Max is gonna open them uh, faster. Now it's not gonna be like a huge difference, but there's gonna be like a slight difference, uh, maybe like a second or two here or there opening these apps again. Uh, not not a big impressive thing here. Like in real world usage, you're not really saving much time. And once that app is open and you're using it, the M1 Max and M3 Max machines felt similar in terms of performance. And even multitasking capabilities felt similar on my M1 Max with 64 gigabytes of memory compared to my 16 inch, which now has a massive amount of 128 gigabytes of unified memory. Even some higher end applications like Photoshop or Affinity Photo felt about the same in usage between both machines. And for simple edits in Final Cut Pro, both Macs felt fluid and responsive. I really wasn't seeing uh, the performance jumps for most of my tasks. Even head-to-head -head tests against a typical video export for my channel did not yield impressive gains in Final Cut Pro. We're talking at max, maybe 30 to 40 seconds saved during a typical Final Cut Pro export of a 4K 12 minute video file. Like, we're not saving a bunch of time here. And at first, that might seem disappointing to you, but to me, uh, this is actually a testament to how good most modern Macs are and just how fast modern Macs are for most things. I think that's actually a good thing that I can sit here and tell you, you don't need to rush out and replace your M1 Max MacBook Pro. And for that matter, I would be lying to you if I was sitting here today and telling you that my old 14 inch M1 Max was slow or telling you that I absolutely needed to replace it with this new M3 Max model. But with that being said, that doesn't mean there aren't improvements here that have made my life easier. While most of the things I do on my laptop feel about the same to me, there are edge cases where I have noticed a huge benefit switching over to the M3 Max. Let's go back into uh, Final Cut Pro. This is an app where I spend a lot of time in video editing for this channel. And there are a few improvements here where I have noticed uh, some really nice benefits. First of all, timeline performance is just ultra smooth. Like no matter what I throw at it, even with more complex projects that require multiple streams of 4K video files, uh, but the biggest area where I really notice improvements to performance is with third-party plugins and effects. On my old 14 inch, there were times where I would notice some slowdowns on my Mac where it had to render out like multiple effects, but on the M3 Max, everything just flies through the editing process and I'm not sitting around waiting around for anything. In fact, the M3 Max at times felt as smooth or honestly even faster than the M1 Max Mac Studio that I use for most of my video editing workflows. And again, that's a desktop class computer. And yeah, these are things that are kind of hard to demonstrate on video for you because, uh, you know, it's not just showing you a benchmark, it's an experience. And I, you know, this is after me using this for a month, you kind of have to take my word on it that some things that I ran into issues with 
and couldn't really capture on video are just working out to be better. But the way I would explain it is the M3 Max really isn't making one type of workflow that much faster, but it's providing enough extra power or memory in little areas that have made my workflows not get slowed down or kind of clogged up in the process. So less spinning wheels, less time rendering, no memory warnings. And that really just translates to the raw ability to just focus completely on using my computer and not managing it. I think one area where I can kind of point to a clearer improvement across the board that is more noticeable is uh, with GPU performance, uh, which I guess is kind of what I'm seeing in Final Cut, right? Like these effects use the GPU and that's where I'm seeing these gains. Now, I, I don't want to rehash the Mac gaming story again, but uh, long story short, most games aren't optimized for Macs, which means less than stellar performance. So if I was running uh, a game that was optimized for Windows or running it through emulation on my Mac, uh, chances are you're not gonna be blown away by the results. But there are a few games that are optimized for the Mac, like Resident Evil Village, and yeah, it runs amazing on this MacBook Pro. I was able to run uh, Resident Evil Village on high resolution, Mac settings, uh, with HDR at 120 frames per second. And this was almost the clearest expression of the potential of the MacBook Pro. Not only was the GPU handling the game without generating that much heat or spinning up the fans to a ridiculous volume, but the gameplay looked great on the 120 Hertz MacBook Pro display and the mini LED HDR display made everything pop. And even the speakers played a role in this. Like the speakers on the 16 inch MacBook Pro sound absolutely fantastic. I didn't really cover that before, but having that display with the smooth gameplay and then just kicking in those really loud firing and impressive speakers. Just led to a really immersive gaming experience on a laptop. And yeah, I know, gaming on the Mac, it's kind of a big joke and you know, you're probably laughing right now, but I really think it's important to reiterate this point that if more games were optimized for the Mac, like Resident Evil and maybe some further games down the line, this MacBook Pro, with the specs it has for hardware, would actually be a competent gaming laptop and kind of further increase uh, the value of this new generation of Macs because, again, the most impressive gains I am seeing out of the M3 Max looks like it's GPU performance. But with all that being said, is this new M3 Max 3 nanometer MacBook Pro a true revolution? No, I really feel like Apple kind of did that two years ago with their first Apple Silicon chips. And yeah, I think it was fair to question back then if a first generation product from Apple, if you were to buy that, might be a mistake because, you know, I think most of us assume that surely Apple would be going through some growing pains during that transition. But it turns out those growing pains weren't really a thing. There weren't really any major bugs with these new Apple Silicon Macs or really any major downsides for going for that first generation product and even performance. Like sometimes with uh, new Apple products or stuff like that, I know it's not a new Apple product, they've been making Macs forever, but it's a new chip. Uh, sometimes you might expect the first generation to have like a major performance issue or something like that. That just didn't happen. The Macs from the M1 generation are still performing absolutely fantastically and the M3 and Max chip is kind of just building on top of that. Still, I don't want to underplay this laptop. This MacBook is truly a Mac studio in a laptop form factor. And it made me realize that while there still are some benefits to a desktop form factor, as someone that primarily used to work exclusively on Mac desktops, especially during the Intel days, uh, it's kind of made me realize that I don't need a desktop computer anymore. This MacBook Pro is the only Mac that I need. And it's kind of crazy to sit here and tell you that, yeah, it's faster than even the M2 Ultra Mac Studio at some tasks in just half a year of time. I'm realizing that I've kind of outgrown desktop Macs and I really feel like this going forward is probably gonna be the only Mac that I use. And that's something I'm not used to. I've, I, for a while now, I've been used to using uh, a really specced out desktop class Mac and also a pretty respectably uh, specced out MacBook Pro at the same time. And now I kind of like just invested all that into a single machine, which is why I maxed it out, 128 gigabytes of memory, maxed out M3 Max chip, uh, the eight terabytes of storage when I bought my 14 inch, I got four terabytes storage, quickly found out, I filled it up really fast with all my video editing projects. So I corrected that this time around. So kind of this MacBook Pro, you know, it's not like a huge, gain for me over my M1 Max 14 inch, 
But, you know, with the respec and everything, it's kind of filling in pain points that I had with that first generation MacBook Pro. For something that's portable and fits in my bag relatively easily, like, yeah, I know it's still the bigger 16 inch model, but I can carry this thing around with me with pretty much no hassle. It really feels like there's no compromise here. And while my old M1 Max model, I could occasionally feel like I was hitting maybe the max capabilities of that system after one month of use, uh, I feel like I haven't even gotten close to the limit of what this MacBook Pro is capable of, at least for me. And it does make me almost wonder if perhaps uh, this is a little overkill for what I need, and I do kind of think it is, but I think that's the point. In a way, it kind of inspires me to maybe push the boundaries even further, and I think that's what a machine like this is all about. Pushing the boundaries or erasing them completely just kind of means that I can focus creatively on what I want to make, and you can't put a price on that. Well, you can. It's an expensive laptop, but if you're coming from an older Intel MacBook Pro, or you're even currently facing limits on a current M1 Mac, uh, this MacBook Pro is really good. It's a beautiful machine and clearly the most powerful, the best laptop that I have ever used. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, please give me a like. If you wanna see more from the channel, make sure you're subscribed. If you wanna buy a MacBook Pro, maybe not even this really specced out model, but just a MacBook Pro in general to pursue your uh, creative passions, uh, I'll leave an affiliate link in the description below. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.